to neighborhoodnewsstudio.com. Today is May, th May 3rd, and we have a really great lineup. We have at 11 o'clock, we have John O'Laughlin, who uh, McDuff lives, who will be reading from uh, another chapter from Stephen Kinzer's great book, The True Flag. And then we have uh, George Webb at noon. At two o'clock, we have Mark Kulak replays for Who's a Tonic Live. At four o'clock, we have uh, Chris Hunter and uh, and possibly uh, Dr. Bowles. And then we have at five o'clock, we have Peter Duke with the Duke Report. So kicking it off will be John O'Laughlin himself. Welcome. Good morning, John. Good morning. Good morning, Ospreys. How are you doing? We're doing good. We're uh, chilling out down here at the, at the beach here, a uh, uh, mystery beach here on the east coast of North Carolina, uh, and it's a beautiful day. So uh, what's what could be wrong? I'm, I'm feeling great. Great. Well, then I'm going to kick it over to you and uh, let you take it away, and then uh, I'll put up a few graphics now and again. All right. That'll be great. All right. I'll see you later. All right, man. Well, good morning or hello, everybody, wherever you are, whatever time it is. I'm John O'Loughlin, and welcome here to Neighborhood News Studio, and uh, where we're broadcasting, simulcasting my show at uh, McDuff Lives. It's McDuff Lives 3, and uh, so welcome whichever feed you're watching. It's glad to have you here. And uh, we're continuing a uh, brief look at a book called The True Flag by Stephen Kinzer, as I explained yesterday. Um, He's a historian who writes about foreign policy of the United States. And, uh, you know, he's been a terrific influence on my work because of his uh, book, The Brothers, uh, the, uh, the Dulles Brothers and Their Secret World War, which is really enlightening. Um, and, you know, you understand that these people are fighting a war without really telling anybody uh, that the Dulles Brothers. Uh, Stephen Kinder's book, The Poisoner in Chief, about uh, Scott, I mean, not Scott, I mean, about um, um, uh, Gottlieb, Sidney Gottlieb, and how uh, his terrific, you know, horrible career went. And uh, that's important because both the Dulles brothers and, and Gottlieb, uh, Sidney Gottlieb, uh, intersect in, in very uh, unfortunate ways with my dad's life. And uh, those of you that have been following me for a while know that the basic theme behind uh, my show, behind uh, McDuff Lives, and that is that my dad um, is uh, a McDuff character, uh, a, the character at the end that comes in and straightens things out after the evil doers are pushed aside in the play. And so that's what I, I think we have to do is we have to carry on my dad's work. Uh, there he is, Gottlieb. Uh, we have to carry on my dad's work, Macduff's work, and so uh, you know we are all we're all Macduff. We, we're all the people that uh, you know the universe is relying on us to straighten things out. In order to straighten things out, we have to understand the past, and that's that's been my mission here is to try to understand myself and then share with you uh, the parts of our past that have led us down this very dark road. In, in fact, we're now engaged in a in a war in Ukraine, which is our as as we say about the Dulles brothers, the people running that war, they want to go to war. They like war. They think war is the best thing they can do. And they're trying to get us involved in a war with Russia. And are we going to allow them to push us into a war with Russia? Well, it's the same question that was that arose 124 years ago in 1898, when the people that believe in what I call the true flag, or what Kinzer calls the true flag, the real America, the one based on the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and the great writings of, of President Lincoln and others that uh, define us as a, a people that does not conquer, that does not go out and exploit other people's uh, lands, and but that we are self-sufficient, that we are the city on the hill that others will look up to, not because they want us to conquer them, but because they would like to 
em emulate us. And that involves a culture based upon the golden rule, upon uh, what are called traditional Christian values. I would say the worst uh, violation of that is done in the name of racism. And uh, if you look into the important figures of our country, uh, many, if not most of them, were grown up and, and believed in racism. They believed that there was a, a hierarchy of races and that those in power happened to be the ones in the power because they are members of this higher class of humans. Uh, nobody was had a higher opinion of themselves than the three men that have uh, become the center of this book, and that would be Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, and William Randolph Hearst. But the theme of the book, I think, is absolutely right, because, you know, we've been looking for the past three, four years in the 20th century um, from World War I, mainly from World War II, to try to understand how we got into this mess and wh why, you know, why we had to uh, go to World War I, why we had to uh, fight World War II, why we end up uh, fighting Korea and Vietnam and studying all of that and coming up with our theories as to why we're doing it. But historically, we hadn't got to the root of it yet. And that's why I love this, this book here, this third book of Kinzer's that I'm sharing on my show, and that is The True Flag. And he does, he does pose the question, you know, what if, what if uh, we had not chosen the imperial route? But we did. And why did we? Well, we had a big fight over it. And the people with the money, you know, they won. The, the other thing that I want to say about that is you really have to compare today's media to William Randolph Hearst. Because William Randolph Hearst, he, not only did he invent popular press and the, the penny uh, copy paper and the, the uh, availability of you know, news by wire services and news everywhere. The news that he told was not news, it was fake. It was all about selling newspapers because he, as the ultimate capitalist, was not interested in educating the American people. He was interested in selling as much ink as he possibly could. And so if it took a lie to sell out ink, that's fine, he did it. And he did it on constantly. Now, with the combination of Hearst, with the, the massive amount of, 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 uh, of media coverage that he could provide, combine that with Teddy Roosevelt, who is this peripatetic uh, crazy man who wants to uh, go out and, and, and take over the world and, and, and call it, you know, call it liberation. But then you add the third person who is the, really the one behind the scenes that, that, that liked to stay behind the scenes. But he was the one he was he was, uh, what, eight years older than Roosevelt, both of them Harvard graduates. And uh, Lodge, of course, had four degrees from from Harvard. But this whole Boston, Harvard, Anglo-Saxon wasp environment has everybody living as if they are in an ivory tower with 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 all of these um dusky dirty people around them whether they're negro or japanese or, or, or chinese or or eastern european the jews the poor ones irish italians it's a mess who wants all of these messy people around you when you're trying to be free <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, except for Lodge was a very, very stuck up, egotistical racist. And he spoke for the Brahmins, the, the, the power of New England, the same power that really that fought and won the Civil War. But now they're fighting in, 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 on behalf, not, a, not of freedom of oppressed people anymore, but simply to expand the commercial empire, the economy. Uh, to keep our uh, farmers producing without going broke, without glutting the market, they wanted to have foreign markets. So they were going to go west and force people to buy American 
food, American products, and to change their culture into an American style culture. That was what they were doing in 1890, 95, 98. And we need to take a hold of our history from that point and not try to start it, you know, with uh, the Dulles brothers. We can go back before them to the generation before them. And that's where we have uh, uh, Kendra's book to guide us. Now, on the anti imperialist side, then. We call them anti-imperialists, but to me, they really are simply the, the true Americans, the ones that want to fulfill the destiny that was set forth in our founding documents, uh, the destiny that our founding fathers in the Revolutionary War or fought for, as opposed to the commercial interests that just want to keep enriching themselves. Anti-imperialists, page uh, 14 here, anti-imperialists who convened at Faneuil Hall on that June 15th were abuzz with two pieces of exciting news. Reports had arrived from the Philippines that three days earlier, at a ceremony outside Manila, the Filipino rebel leader, Emilio Aguinaldo, had unfurled a new flag, led a chorus in singing a newly composed national anthem, and proclaimed a new nation, the Philippine Republic. Filipinos had declared an end to three and a half centuries of Spanish colonial rule. This electrified American anti-imperialists. They insisted that as a freedom-loving nation, the United States was, must immediately recognize Philippine independence. This development added urgency and, in their eyes, immense moral weight to the anti-imperial cause. The day's morning papers also carried reports of another thrilling declaration. The prairie firebrand, William Jennings Bryan, had delivered a powerful speech in Omaha that seemed certain to bring the debate over imperialism to the center of American life. Until this moment, no major political leader had spoken out against the rush to empire. Bryan had been the Democratic nominee for president in 1896 and was thought likely to run again in 1900. He was one of the most popular figures in the United States and arguably the country's most spellbinding orator. Anti-imperialists in Boston immediately recognized the value of Bryan's support. Many of them were prosperous businessmen, lawyers, professors, philosophers, and aesthetes. Bryan was the opposite, a barnstorming, rabble-rousing populist beloved by millions of farmers, immigrants, and poor people. His speech in Omaha echoed several that had been given in New England salons, but it was delivered to a huge crowd by one of the nation's leading politicians. That took the anti-imperial cause into the American heartland. Bryan began not with an exposition of history, but with an ap apocalyptic warning rooted in his Christian fundamentalism. Quote, Jehovah deals with nations as he deals with men and for both decrees that the wages of sin is death. History will vindicate the position taken by the United States in the war with Spain. If, however, a contest undertaken for the sake of humanity degenerates into a war of conquest, we shall find it difficult to meet the charge of having added hypocrisy to greed. In our national, is our national character so weak that we cannot withstand the temptation to appropriate the first place piece of land that comes within our reach? To inflict upon the enemy all possible harm is legitimate warfare, but shall we contemplate a scheme for the colonization of the Orient merely because our ships won a remarkable victory in the harbor of Manila? Our guns destroyed a Spanish fleet but can they destroy that self-evident truth that governments derive their just powers not from superior force, but from the consent of the governed? As organizers of the Faneuil Hall meeting took their places on the stage shortly before three o'clock that afternoon, they had reason to believe they were riding the crest of history. They could not imagine that Americans would wish to capture the Philippines 
after Filipino patriots had proclaimed independence, or that they would sully their national honor by seizing Puerto Rico, subjugating Cuba, or annexing Hawaii. The sudden emergence of Brian as an ally seemed proof that the multitudes were on their side. When the anti-imperialist meeting was gaveled to order on the afternoon of June 15th, the House of Representatives in Washington had been debating the annexation of Hawaii for several hours. By 4.30, both sessions were drawing to a close. The climatic speech, speech to Boston was delivered by one of the city's most eloquent lawyers, Moorfield Story. How can we justify, he says, quote, how can we justify the annexation of Hawaii, whose people, outside the small fraction now kept in power by us, are notoriously opposed to it? Let us once govern any considerable body of men without their consent, and it is but a question of time how soon this republic shares the fate of Rome. After Story finished, one of his comrades came to the podium and read a four-part resolution. This was a historic moment, the first time an anti-imperialist resolution was presented to a public meeting in the United States. It echoed through the air that once carried the defiant words of Samuel Adams and John Hancock, and later those of William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. Quote, Resolved that a war begun as an unselfish endeavor to fulfill a duty to humanity by ending the unhappy situation in Cuba must not be perverted into a war of conquest. Resolved that any annexation of territory as a result of this war would be a violation of the national faith pledged in the joint resolution of Congress, which declared that the United States disclaimed, quote, any disposition or intention to exercise sovereignty, jurisdiction, or control over Cuba, except for the pacification thereof, unquote. A disclaimer, which was intended to mean that this country has no selfish purpose in making war and which, in spirit, applies to every other possession of Spain. Resolved that the mission of the United States is to help the world by an example of successful self-government and that to abandon the principles and the policy under which we have prospered and embrace the doctrine and practices now called imperial is to enter the path which, with other great republics, has ended in the downfall of free institutions. Resolved that our first duty is to cure the evils in our own country. Isn't that what I want? Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we all, all of us who find ourselves uh, wanting to restore the, the Republic, you know, I mean, you, you all know, and if you follow me, that, that my, my opinion is the Republic was, was stolen from us with the assassination of President Kennedy. But whether you look at it with me, that that was the, that's the date when it, when it happened. Or perhaps you might find that it happened in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act. Or you might find even that it was the Civil War or perhaps even this annexation of Hawaii that was the violation of our own principles that ended the republic that we think we belong to. It is a historical fact that the people in power in 1898 were racists, that they thought that they had a ticket from God, a, a, a permission slip from God to take from the lesser races and thereby set them free, which is crazy because they're already free. The reason that they don't, people, American people didn't think that they were free was because of the press, because of William Randolph Hearst, and because of the insanity of Theodore Roosevelt, who ran about madly proclaiming that he was the most patriotic, wonderful hero that the country needed and must follow, and he's, you know, going to uh, make 
America the, the, the leader of the world. And, you know, with a, com a combination of the press, the bully pulpit, which is, of course, Theodore Roosevelt's own words that calls it the bully pulpit, um, but with the backing of the incredible money of the, of the wasps of New England, that three-way power was more powerful than all the rest of us and all of the millions that William Jennings Bryan uh, was speaking to. Um, that powerful combination took us over, maybe not a rebellion, but at least they had all the back rooms covered and they had their results were coming out of the public forum as they had deigned that they should come out in their secret meetings. Here's on the other side, um, Representative William Hepburn of Mississippi. Quote, who, quote, we have not a foot of territory that we have not taken from others unquote, he reminded his colleagues. And I think it's a fair reminder, right? It, it, the United States, you know, first of all, we rebelled, so we took it from the mother country, right? Then we fought with the French, we fought with the Indians, we fought in, against the Spanish in Florida, um, and w we removed the Cherokee, we did all of these horrific things to native people. Uh, we, uh, you know, disenfranchised all the African uh, Americans. We did horrible, horrible things in taking the continental United States. You know, we took substantial portions of Mexico from, from that country. But up to then, it's all been continental United States plus the Alaska Purchase. Now, the idea of actually creating colonies as opposed to integrating the continent into one country. Now we're talking about exploitation. Now we're talking about imperialism of a very, very dark kind where we will take those people, use them, abuse them, terrorize them if necessary. Well, look at Abu Ghraib. Look at what we're doing now. This attitude from Lodge, Teddy Roosevelt, and Hearst is the attitude that we're looking at right now of Biden's administration. They want America to rule the world. And Russia has always been a, uh, they've coveted war with Russia. Another point that's made in this book, which I'll just repeat now off, off the top of my head, is this. The United States had 25 years without war, up to 1898. That's a whole generation of people grown up without knowing the horrors of war. And we've got that now. You know, except for, you know, the, the overseas conflicts that we don't see much of. You know, the last real war we were in was the Vietnam War. You know, with the draft and total commitment, that was the last time we've really been in a war where your neighbor down the street could get come home in a box, could get maimed, could get killed, captured. You know, the Vietnam War you know, over in 1975. So that's almost 50 years ago. And we're in that same vulnerable position. The multitudes are like, we're looking for our leaders to, to tell us what to do, but we're being led into what could be the, the worst war we've ever faced if we let them draw us into this war. So here's the arguments, one side and the other, the anti-imperialists, meaning 
the true flag people, and the imperialists who might well be called the false flag people. Here's some more from that Congressman William Hepburn of Mississippi. Who dares to say that even if we should enter into this new policy, the fate which befell the Roman Empire would be ours? Look at England. What would she be today if confined to her insular domain? What could she be? The mistress of the seas? Oh, no. One of the leading nations of the earth? Oh, no. Giving her laws, her literature, and her civilization to the rest of the world? Oh, no. She would have been powerless for this great end. Had there not been a Frederick the Great who could say that the little duchy of Brandenburg would have extended itself into the great German empire of today? Who can say? This same, quote, greed this thirst for annexation, this desire for new territory, this passion for extending civilization has blessed the earth. William Terry of Arkansas, quote, a war solemnly declared for the cause of humanity, justice, and the vindication of the national honor and the national flag is being perverted from the plain and proper purposes for which it was authorized by Congress and endorsed by the American people. That flag, sir, in all its history was never unjust in conquest and aggression. It has always been glorious and honored among all the nations of the earth because wherever it floated, upon the land or upon the sea, it was recognized as the emblem and very symbol of freedom, humanity, and justice. Let us stand true to the lofty principles of those who gave it to our keeping." Unquote. That day, June 15th, 1898, marked the beginning of a debate that would soon consume the country. The American anti-imperialist movement was born at Faneuil, at Faneuil Hall in Boston on the same afternoon Congress set the United States on its imperial path. Battle lines were drawn for an epic clash. Now, speaking of false flags, chapter two, there may be an explosion. Heads turned and conversation stopped when the youngest member of the New York State Assembly took his seat on April 18th, 1882. He looked like the parody of a Victorian dandy, hair curled and parted in the middle, mutton chop sideburns, a thin mustache, and a monocle in one eye with a gold chain looped over his ear. His formal morning coat, which swept down almost to his shoes, opened to reveal skin-tight bell-bottom trousers. In one hand, he carried a, go a gold-tipped cane, in the other, a silk top hat. Who's the dude? One bemused assemblyman asked another. That's Theodore Roosevelt of New York, came the reply. For a time, Roosevelt remained an object of curiosity and ridicule in Albany. Co colleagues called him various names, uh, a newspaper wondered if he was one of those men given to sucking the knob of an ivory cane. Roosevelt soon modified his dress and manner, but he turned out to have an even more remarkable quality. He was constantly and irrepressibly in motion, a hyperactive, frenetic bundle of energy. He ricocheted from one cause to another. He demanded civil service reform, warred on the liquor industry, and fought increases in the minimum wage. A fellow assemblyman called him a brilliant madman. It appeared before him a couple of years later. Uh, he had not yet discovered the vehicle he would ride to power. 
it appeared before him a couple of years later in the figure of Henry Cabot Lodge. A gaunt, imperious Bostonian he vaguely remembered from the Porcellian Club at Harvard. In 1884, the two young men, Roosevelt was 25, Lodge 34, were delegates to the Republican National Convention in Chicago. They took an instant liking to each other. Lodge sensed that Roosevelt would become a national figure of real importance. Here was born the partnership that a decade and a half later would push America toward empire. Roosevelt entered politics, as many do, to see how far he could rise. Lodge was just as ambitious, but unlike his younger friend, he had a cause, a focused goal. He wanted the United States to dominate the world. There you go. This, this is, you know, the mother load of intention to dominate the world that is driving Dulles, is driving, you know, all of the, the deep state right now to dominate the world. This is the personality and this is the beginning of it. How he would drive his country to this imperial height, he did not yet know, but he was resolved to make it his life's work. Roosevelt, who had been captivated by hero stories since childhood and loved nothing more than the dream of war, was Lodge's instinctive ally. Both believed two things passionately, that the United States must become one of the world's great powers and that it could do so only by taking foreign lands. For years, they waited for their country to catch up with them. Lodge and Roosevelt wanted to do more than simply change the way the United States approached the world. They wanted Americans to begin ruling people far beyond their own continent without those people's consent. It would be an immense historical leap. This most astonishing of all American years began like any other. There was no hint that after 1898, nothing would ever be the same, but history exploded and suddenly the audacious dreams of Lodge, Roosevelt and their friends came within reach. There's no returning to the old normal, right? 1898, there's a new normal. We are now an imperial power. You can't go back. So get, get with the program, get with it. We are now the Colossus, the world's power. You know, all we need is to elect Roosevelt and to get us a big white fleet, go around the world and take all of these little native run backwards jurisdictions and make them American. And that's what they set about to do. But it's, 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 again, it's another resonance with today, isn't it? When he says that you, you can't go back, there's no, no returning to the old normal. Well, I kind of like the old normal compared to today, don't you? You remember William H. Seward? He was the uh, Secretary of State of Lincoln, the one that bought the Alaska Purchase. That's the next paragraph here. These are the lands that Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State, William H. Seward, wished the United States to acquire. And here they are. Hawaii, Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, the Virgin Islands, Canada, Greenland, and Iceland. By the time Seward died in 1872, none had become American. In that same year, though, Henry Cabot Lodge graduated from Harvard. It was a neat handoff. Lodge revered Seward and set out to pursue his imperial dream. Expansion has always been central to the American idea. Jefferson doubled the size of the United States by purchasing the Louisiana Territory from France in 1803. Over the following decades, the United States secured its sovereignty in North America, 
by clearing native peoples from the West and seizing a large part of Mexico. In 1867, Seward himself arranged the American purchase of Alaska. To Lodge, he bequeathed the next challenge, ushering the United States from a continental empire to overseas empire. Lodge was an exemplar of American aristocracy. His family had accumulated great wealth on the, on the seas as privateers during the American Revolution, as dealers in opium, rum, and slaves, and finally as masters of trade across the Caribbean, Mer Mediterranean, and Pacific. Several of his ancestors had been politicians. He became the most powerful and prominent figure this globally ambitious family produced. Known throughout his life as Cabot, he was born in 1850 and grew up on Beacon Hill and at his family's manor in the seaside village of Nahant. His upbringing was one of extreme privilege. Before he was out of his teens, he knew half a dozen European capitals, but he never saw, understood, or cared about the tumultuous lives of ordinary Americans. In Boston, his favorite outing was to the commercial wharf where amid sailors and salt air, he watched exotic goods being unloaded from his father's ships, the Argonaut, the Cossack, the Don Quixote, the Magnet, the Kremlin, and the Storm King. When Lodge ran for a seat in the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 1879, Democrats ridiculed him as a silver-spooned young man, a la-di-da boy, the gentleman rider of Nahant. Nonetheless, he won the third of his district's three seats. Blonde and blue-eyed, already sporting the pointed beard he would keep all his life, he began plotting his rise. Lodge was vain, austere, and aloof. He spoke in a high-pitched, raspy voice that some compared to chalk screeching on a blackboard. Not only did he lack the common touch, he had no interest in cultivating it. Many saw him as an arrogant snob. He saw himself this way. From the beginning of his political career, he realized that his character and personality would prevent him from ever winning the presidency. Yet, only a president could lead the United States decisively toward empire. In 1884, Lodge opposed the nomination of the corrupt James G. Blaine for the presidency, and so did Roosevelt. The two men corresponded, met for dinner at Delmonico's, cemented their friendship at the Republican Convention in Chicago. Both were Harvard graduates from wealthy families, limited, limitlessly self-confident, who loved horseback riding, were drawn to the sea, considered war glorious, and felt strong, felt enough energy within themselves to move the world. They failed to prevent Blaine's nomination, but set out to become co-founders of the modern American empire. Roosevelt welcomed Lodge's friendship, which came at a crossroads in his life. Earlier that year, Roosevelt had been shattered by the death of his mother and wife on the same day, February 14th, 1884, and reacted by plunging into frenetic action. He bought a cattle ranch in North Dakota, hunted game, slept in tents, and gathered material for self-promoting books with evocative titles such as Hunting Trips of a Ranchman. It was therapy by play acting. The rich boy living out his fantasy of rugged life, when Roosevelt killed his first buffalo, according to one account, he abandoned himself to complete hysteria, dancing around the carcass while whooping and shrieking. For the rest of his life, he rhapsodized about the keen delight of hunting in lonely lands. Humbug scorned Mark Twain. Nothing in Roosevelt's public person's persona irritated him more than the outdoorsman image. Quote, he has no sympathy with any brand of nature study other than his own, Twain wrote. In a word, Mr. Roosevelt is not a naturalist, but a game killer. Of the real spirit of animal life, of their habits as discovered with quiet watching with no desire to kill, he knows nothing 
and never will learn until he goes into the woods, leaving his pack of dogs, his rifle, his prejudice, and his present disposition behind him. Upon returning from a trip west in 1886, Roosevelt decided to run for mayor of New York. It was an ill-conceived campaign. He finished a poor third and retired to his Long Island estate at Oyster Bay to ruminate. For the first time, but not the last time, Lodge intervened. Following the election of Benjamin Harrison as president in 1886, he relentlessly lobbied the new president to give Roosevelt a job in Washington. Harrison was reluctant, but in 1889, he finally named him to the Civil Service Commission. Roosevelt and Lodge, living close to each other in Washington, became intimate friends as well as political partners. Together, they wrote a book for young readers called Hero Tales from American History, a collection of idealized stories about Daniel Boone, Andrew Jackson, and other swashbucklers who exemplified, quote, the stern and manly qualities which are essential to the well-being of a masterful race, unquote. <sighs> what is this about masterful race? Um, wh why is that idea attractive at all? It's, it sounds awful to me. It sounds, it's, it's just disgust, disgusting, the idea of having one race be the masters. This is America, though. This is this is 120 some years ago. The most popular people in our country are thinking this way, talking this way, writing this way, selling newspapers, and getting elected by saying this kind of nonsense. The masterful race, indeed. Continuing, Roosevelt and Lodge, they spent countless hours discussing ways to awaken Americans to what they considered the call of destiny. Ooh, the call of destiny. You ever heard that before? The spear of destiny? Yeah. The triumph of the will, perhaps. Is this not the same call that, you know, consumed Germany with the Nazis? It's the same thing. You know, it, it didn't start with Hitler. Sadly, it started with people that we consider to be American elites, American, you know, people to be looked up to. And I think that's part of our mission here at McDuff Lives is to say, wait a minute, let's look at these people again. Are we sure that those are the Americans we want to emulate? I don't think so. With America happily at peace during the 1890s, Roosevelt racked his brain to find a possible enemy. Quote, I should welcome almost any war, for I think the country needs one, he wrote in 1895. For a time, he mused about fighting the aboriginal owners of Australia or Siberia, which seemed to him a glorious prospect because, quote, the most ultimately righteous of all wars is a war with savages, unquote. What is so righteous about that? I, I just, these, this mind of his, of these people is just different from the way mine works. So what is righteous about going to war with people that have, you know, have nowhere near your technological ability, nowhere near the power that you can project. No, they're living in a, in a world that they, that they do not understand how horrible war with Americans would be. It's just, or to just subjugate them as slaves. It's just, I can't, I can't wrap my brain around it, but that's who these people are. And that's what we need to know. We need to learn that these people are egotistical, elite racists of the kind that America should never give any power to whatsoever.
Since no such war could be arranged, he began to imagine fighting a European power instead. Any would do. Quote, and this is Roosevelt, quote, Frankly, I don't know that I should be sorry to see a bit of a spar with Germany, he wrote to a friend. The burning of New York and a few other seacoast cities would be a good object lesson in the need of an adequate system of coastal defenses. We elected that guy president. Yeah. That's the problem we have. It's the, it's the media. Without William Randolph Hearst and the corrupt media then and now, we wouldn't be out there imperializing. All right, let's see, where shall I pick up? Lodge and Roosevelt wanted their country to strengthen its navy, project power, and rule faraway lands, but neither man had a systematic plan to accomplish it. It took the naval strategist, Alfred Thayer Mahan, to give order to their wild surmise. Mahan had served in the Navy during the Civil War and went on to command ships, but he was a poor captain, steering several of his vessels into collisions. Sometimes depression overwhelmed him so fully that he could not leave his cabin. Shore duty suited him better. In 1885, he secured appointment as a lecturer at the fledgling Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island and the next year became its president. There he met Theodore Roosevelt, who came to the college to deliver a speech in which he used the word war 67 times. Roosevelt encouraged Mahan to collect his notes into a book. It emerged as, quote, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783. And it remains one of the most influential works of military history ever written in the United States. Mahan argued that control of the seas is always crucial to countries seeking to achieve or maintain far-reaching power. If the United States wished to join the scramble for the world's wealth, he concluded, it would have to build warships and dispatch them to take distant islands, ports, peninsulas, and, quote, strong places where a navy can be protected and refurbished, unquote. I am frankly an imperialist in the sense that I believe that no nation, certainly no great nation, should henceforth maintain the policy of isolation which fitted our early history, Mahan wrote. Imperialism, the extent, extension of national authority over alien communities, is a dominant note in the world of politics today. Mahan's book gave Lodge and Roosevelt the guide they had lacked, complete with historical detail that seemed to prove their case though it did not explain the rise of land-based empires such as Russia or Germany. Mahan became the toast of Washington. He wrote articles and testified at congressional hearings. Quote, Captain Mahan has written distinctively the best and most important and also the most interesting book on naval history, which has been produced on either side of the water in many a long year, Roosevelt wrote. Our greatest need is the need for a fighting fleet we need a large navy composed not only of cruisers, but containing also a full proportion of powerful battleships um, able to meet those of any other nation. Mahan did not see power projection as simply an abstract good or an exercise of national ego. He promoted it above all as an answer to the central dilemma of American life. By the end of the 19th century, American farmers and factory owners had so fully mastered techniques of mass production that they were producing more than they could sell. They urgently needed new markets. Now, how often do we think about that angle to imperialism? 
but this this if you if you consider that lodge comes from that new england trader mentality that the the china clippers and the opium and the slaves and the rum trade and all all of this is all about free trade or at least about uh, trade to make profit and when you look at an empire saying well we have the moral high ground we have to do this for humanity well that's false the real reason they're doing it is to extend their commercial empire period that's it there's no morality about it it's all about extending their own wealth. Business and political leaders saw only one way out of this crisis, overseas markets. These would be the safety valve by which explosive social pressures inside American society would be eased. During the mid 1890s, Politicians, businessmen, and editorial writers focused continually on the theme of glut and the absolute necessity of finding new markets for American products. Mahan reminded them that overseas commerce would have, have to be protected or imposed on unwilling nations by naval power. He fused America's commercial and strategic interests into a global strategy that captured many imaginations. The great nations are rapidly absorbing for their future expansion and their present defense all the waste places of the earth, Lodge wrote. As one of the great nations of the world, the United States must not fall out of the line of march. Several times, Lodge and Roosevelt saw encouraging glimmers of militarism in the United States. Encouraging glimmers of militarism. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what happens when, when, when the memory of, of the horrors of war disappears. You know, I mean, you know, my father would never want us to get into another war. But people of, of, of my generation or later, younger people now, they don't know what it's like. So they're like, you know, OK, let's go kick those Russians ass. You know, let's go kick some Russian butt. No, you don't want to do that. It's not a good idea. You know, let's take care of everybody's grandmother and grandfather in this country that doesn't have enough to eat. Let's take care of everybody that doesn't have fresh, good, clean, healthy water. Let's improve the lives of Americans. I mean, our life expectancy is, is shortening. Our food is getting unnutritious and even poisonous. Don't we have enough to do at home? It's the same trio. It's just different names, but it's 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 the 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 old wealth lodge. The the uh, leader which I guess we don't really have a leader, but these people are just following whatever Biden wants. So they've got this, you know, kind of a person that doesn't really have a lot of internal understanding of what he's doing, but he thinks he's doing the right thing. If he thinks at all, I mean, I, I can't even talk about Biden anymore. Such a disaster. But then you have the, the press, you know, the William Randolph Hearst, you know, you, now you've got your CNN and you've got everything owned uh, by the elites that are driving the war. So you've got the same three factions pulled together, you know, put together to keep the American people from understanding what's really going on and what's at stake and how bad this could turn out. And it could be very, very bad. All right, several times Lodge and Roosevelt saw encouraging glimmers of militarism in the United States. In 1891, Americans were roused to a fury by news that two American sailors had been stabbed to death in a fight outside the True Blue Saloon in Valparaiso, Chile. Quote, we are actually at the mercy of a 10th rate country, 
Roosevelt fumed. Behind this manufactured crisis lay a desire to slap down the powerful Ch Chilean Navy and ensure access to nitrate deposits that were bringing profit to an American company, W.R. Grace. Now, this is where I'm going to stop today because W.R. Grace connects all of that that we've just read, these two shows from The True Flag by Kinzer. W.R. Grace, Knights of Malta, Peter Grace, The Next Generation, W.R. Grace and Company, working secretly behind the scenes to promote the agenda of the same deep state. But now when we connect, you know, let's go all the way back to Seward, to Lodge, to Roosevelt, Admiral, Admiral Mahan, Lodge, and now you put the W.R. Grace Company in there and you've just knitted it all together in one big quilt of imperialism that is driving our country's foreign policy today, driving the world towards world war once again for the benefit of the few that we are so naive as to put in power. All right, thanks very much for being with me. I'm going to pick up the iPhone here and see if we can extend our reach out toward the toward the ocean to give you guys just one little one little glimpse of the beautiful place where we're staying and uh, then we'll turn it back over to the studio. But let me just walk outside for a second and you all enjoy this. There you go. Lovely. Well, it's nice to be free not be locked down, be able to come out here to the ocean and see all the beautiful nature that's all around us Amen. and uh, relax and rest a little bit so we can recharge ourselves for more, more of what we need to do to keep our country free. All right, that's it. I'll turn it all back over to the studio. Thank you very much, guys, and we will talk Thank to you Thank you, tomorrow. John. Thank you very much. I love this book. Thank you, John. Awesome stuff. We're going to move, remove John here. All right, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, John, for that awesome presentation. If you do want to support John, of course, his Patreon is the place to do it. Um, and of course, screamingospreys.com is the place to check out all the latest, all the upcoming shows and schedules. Here is uh, John's Patreon. He'd certainly appreciate your support on Patreon. Um, every dollar goes a long way. This is uh, this is where you get the most bang for your buck is with citizen journalists, citizen researchers like John O'Loughlin uh, and the crew over here at Neighborhood News. So certainly any support you can give him uh, as well as Neighborhood News on Patreon.